Well, what a joy to be with you this morning, and uh, let me give you greetings from the Waukewa Baptist Association, where I have the opportunity to serve as the Director of Missions, and uh, I've been in this area for 18 years now, served for 16 years, and uh, half of my ministry, pastoral ministry, is at North Conway Baptist Church. Last year and a half, I had the privilege to serve as the Director of Missions, as they have a new title for it, it's called the Associational Mission Strategist and I'm thankful to be able to serve in this role. And I am thankful for this church, and it's providential to be here today. Of course, to be able to help one of my favorite pastors, Brother Charles, I appreciate him, and I'm thankful for him, and uh, I love him. But uh, also, because of what today is. Uh, in Southern Baptist Convention, this particular Sunday, just before Easter, uh, every year is set aside as Church Planting Sunday Emphasis. And uh, on this day, we uh, think about and pray for our church planters and the new churches, and uh, thankful for that. And you have an integral part with that when it comes to our association. Um, of course, you are, this church is one of the oldest churches in this area, uh, also one of the oldest churches in the Waccamaw Baptist Association. Uh, in fact, the Waccamaw Baptist Association exists because of you. Did you know that? Uh, the Waccamaw, let me give you a little history lesson. The Waccamaw Baptist Association began in the early 1800s when churches from the Cape Fear Association, of which this ch church, it was Honey Camp then, I think is what it became, uh, this church uh, came out of the Cape Fear Association in North Carolina. Cape Fear Association sent missionaries to this area, Ory County, to plant new churches. This was a growing area up and down the Waccamaw. There was... Uh, Conway was beginning, Conway Borough then was beginning to grow, and this church was a part of that. Also, missionaries came from the Welsh Neck Association here in South Carolina. They came from two different directions, came to Ory County, and started planting churches. Uh, they, <laughs> you know, yeah, people will be competitive over anything, and this is a good competition. These two associations, the one here from South Carolina and North Carolina, got into competition who could start the most churches. And uh, that's good. I'm from North Carolina. My wife is from South Carolina, so I know that competition. But uh, anyway, they started planting churches in this area. Cape Fear, uh, this church uh, was, I read from your records, 1822 was admitted to Cape Fear. And then in 1876 uh, was admitted into the newly formed Waccamaw Baptist Association. And uh, that was just two years after the association was founded. This association began in 1874, and uh, we are uh, celebrating, uh, 1876, we're celebrating 150 years of ministry as far as this association is concerned, and uh, you've been a part of this. Also, uh, doing some research on history as far as Green Sea is concerned, this church is responsible. In fact, in our history documents that I have at the association, this church was known as a mother church. Uh, this church was responsible for planting new churches all over this area. And uh, some of the uh, churches, oldest churches in our association in this area, came from church planting efforts right from here. And uh, that continues today in our association. I'm thankful for your continued uh, mission emphasis. Well, Charles is a very mission-minded pastor. And I know recently, I think the fundraiser was for two missionaries that you're sending out right from this church, and I appreciate that. You contributed to Annie Armstrong and the other missions offering, so thankful for what uh, you do there. Uh, we currently have several uh, brand new church plants. They've been started within the last couple of years, uh, scattered across the association, and uh, we are praying for them and supporting them. You know what's happened to Ori County. It's growing. When I came here in 2006, the population of Ori County is about 260,000. Uh, today, it's just a little shy of 400,000, and it is expected to increase uh, over the next couple of years. We're one of the fastest growing areas by percentage. Of course, I don't have to tell you that. You know that. Uh, you know that we are growing everywhere. And I, as my travels as the Association Mission Director, uh, go across the association, wherever churches I go, wherever I go, uh, there'll be a patch of woods one week and I go by the next week it's clear and I go by the next week there's a sign the next week I go by there's a house put up uh, and neighborhoods are being built everywhere in fact in 2022 uh, the net gain for uh, our area our county was 17,000 people that works out to about 50 people a day um, 
17,000, let me give you an equivalent. If you take all 78 churches in our association, if you add up their membership, it equals about 18,000. That means the number of people that are members of our associational churches is moving here, uh, moved here in uh, 2022. Uh, we don't have the figures yet for 23, but uh, they're going to continue to increase. So the need for church planning and new neighborhoods to be able to reach people with the gospel uh, is continuing. And uh, I'm thankful for your partnership with that, with the 78 churches that make up the Welcome Up Map Association, 2,100 churches across the state of South Carolina, and then the 47,000 churches that make up the Southern Baptist Convention. You are a part of the greatest missionary, Baptist missionary force in the world. Uh, 3,500 foreign missionaries, 29 church planning, 2,900 church planning couples are scattered across the country today planning brand new churches. And so we're thankful for that and thankful for uh, what you do in that area and being a part of that mission. Well, let's go to the Word this morning. If you will take your Bibles and if you'll turn to Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10 this morning, Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Let's set the context a little bit before I read the scripture. Of course, next Sunday is what we celebrate as what we call Palm Sunday. And uh, on Palm Sunday uh, is when Jesus made his way into the city of Jerusalem. And we know the story. The palm branches were laid down. Jesus was riding on the donkey. And they were proclaiming him as the king. And uh, of course, within a week, they were nailing him to a cross. But on that Sunday... They were proclaiming him as they thought he was going to be the Messiah, the King, the one who's going to throw off. He's going to fix this. He's going to fix this political mess. <laughs> no, we need a King to do that. I mean, we need we need King Jesus is the only one who can fix our mess. Amen. And uh, they were they were looking for Jesus. Well, then of course you have Good Friday of that week, and then the next Sunday is Easter Sunday. And those two Sundays are coming. But this particular story happens just before that. In fact, it's probably Thursday or Friday before Palm Sunday. If you go back in the book of Luke and get to about Luke chapter 9, Luke is telling us the story of Jesus. You know, in Luke chapter 2, you have the birth of Jesus. He's uh, baptized and then he begins his ministry and he's been calling disciples. He's been preaching, teaching, and leading his disciples but about Luke chapter 9, Luke says something. He said that Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus had been up in the Galilee area, which was north of Jerusalem. That's where Peter and Andrew and John and many of his disciples were there. That's along the Sea of Galilee. Beautiful area. Had the opportunity to be able to see that. Kind of out in the country, the small villages, small towns. Kind of like this area through here. Beautiful farming country and fishing country there on the lake and Jesus has spent most of his ministry kind of in that rural area out in Galilee. But he's coming to the big city. He's coming to Jerusalem. And Luke chapter 9, he begins, he says, guys, I'm going to Jerusalem. And so they begin to follow him. And so from Luke chapter 9 through chapter 18, it's really the kind of a, for a few weeks, a couple of months, it's Jesus' journey from the northern part of Israel, Galilee, coming down to Jerusalem. And, uh, well, then he's going to go up to Jerusalem. I'll share that with you in a few minutes. And he's going to go to Jerusalem, of course, where he's going to enter the city, be proclaimed as king on Easter Sunday. Thursday, he's going to be arrested. Friday, he's going to be hanging on the cross. And then Sunday, he's going to be rising again from the dead. But that was his purpose. That's been his purpose all along. Jesus did not come simply to be someone who did miracles and to be someone who set a good example and to someone who could be a good moral teacher and that someone that we could look at and just say, hey, you know, let's be like Jesus. Can't we all be just loving and kind like Jesus? You know, can't we be forgiving like Jesus? You know, can't we love our neighbor like Jesus wants us to love? That's how most of the world and many people who are American see Jesus. Jesus is an example. He's a good man. And even they look at Easter. You need to understand this. You and I look at Easter differently. We look at Jesus as dying on the cross of Calvary for our sins, rising again, so that you and I can have eternal life and live with the Father forever. The world sees Easter as a, that's a great inspirational story. You know, springtime. 
There are, there's new things that happen. And Jesus, his life at Easter represents, you know, spring and new things happening. And you can have a second chance and all that kind of stuff. Well, folks, Jesus was going to Jerusalem to bear your sins and my sins on the cross of Calvary so that we could be forgiven, so that we didn't have to go to hell. That's why Jesus came. He did not come to say, be like me. Jesus came to die for your sins and to die for mine. So that's why he's going to Jerusalem. So this story, Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, Zacchaeus happens just before he gets to Jerusalem. And I think it's a great story that illustrates for us the grace of Jesus for all sinners. Luke chapter 19, verse 1. Here's what the Bible says. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, because, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up in the sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he saw him and he said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He's gone to be a guest with a man who was a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. And here's what I want to concentrate on, because Luke gives us the summary of, and he tells us exactly who Jesus is, why he came, and he tells us why we have the story of the saving of Zacchaeus. And Luke says, the Bible says to us, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Is the truth. Because Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, sinners should respond to his call quickly and with joyful repentance. Now, I said that Jesus is coming from the Sea of Galilee, and he is coming southward, and he comes from the Sea of Galilee to Jericho. Jericho in the Sea of Galilee sits in a depression. You know, this but Sea of Galilee is about 600 feet below sea level. And there's a valley that runs, and he comes from Galilee, and he comes to Jericho. And when he comes to Jericho, Jesus, when he's... He stops there because most travelers, when they were coming to Jerusalem, would come to Jericho, and then they would head up the mountain. It's a 4,000-foot climb from Jericho going up to Jerusalem. You're below sea level to about, about 3,400 feet above sea level. So Jesus comes to Jericho. Let me tell you about Jericho a little bit. It was a Levitical city. So what, what's a Levitical city? Well, you remember back in the Israel's history that the tribe of Levi who became the priest, they were not given uh, land to live on. All the rest of the tribes got land, but the Levites didn't. They were given cities to live in. And Jericho was one of those cities where the Levites, who were the priests, that's where they lived. <coughs> so, the city of Le so the city of Jericho was full of Pharisees, Le Levites. It was full of church people, church men who did religious things, and they would go up to Jerusalem to go to the temple to perform all the ceremonies and things there. So you have a city that's a Levitical city, but you also have a city that's full of commerce. And when there's commerce and there's a government, there's going to be taxes. Just the way of life. Well, the Roman government is in charge of this area, and the Roman government is taking taxes out of the city of Jericho. Remember, everybody's traveling to Jericho, then they head up to Jerusalem. It's a great place to concentrate people, collect taxes, and this guy named Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector for Jericho, which means he, was a, he had everybody working under him. Now, how did he make his living? The Roman government would tell Zacchaeus as the chief of tax collectors for this city. The Roman government would say, well, we believe there's about so many people who live there, and we believe that X amount of money in taxes should be collected. 
Now, Zacchaeus, that's what we want. You collect X amount, put it in a box, it's going to go to Rome. That's what we need. Now, Zacchaeus, here's how you're going to get paid. We don't care how much you collect beyond that. And whatever you collect beyond what Rome wants, then that's yours. Now, can you imagine having the power of the Roman government behind you to tax people, and you're going to make your salary legally by getting whatever you can get from people around you. And if you can understand that the most unscrupulous liars, cheaters, thieves would gravitate toward this job, and they could do whatever they needed to do. They had power just as long. Rome was like, as long as you send us the money, I don't care how you get it. That's Zacchaeus. But he's the chief tax collector, which means he's the scoundrel of the scoundrels. He's the mafia boss for collecting taxes in Jericho. And so you have this juxtaposition. You have a city that's full of religious people, Levites. They go up to the worship. They go up the mountain, and they go to Jerusalem, and they serve. And Jericho's full of them. And then you have Zacchaeus. Someone who probably put one of your family members in jail to get money out of them. Who has stolen money from you all of your life. He is one of the most hated men. In fact, the word sinner in that time was synonymous with being a tax collector, a publican. Someone who was a sinner. Levites, Zacchaeus. Now you're going to have an intersection of those two groups of people and Jesus coming through Jer Jericho, heading up to within a week, he's going to die on the cross. What a, what a place. This sets up for us everything that comes in the Passion Week, Palm Sunday, heading into Easter, because we have clearly identified why Jesus is going to Jerusalem. Luke says, For the Son of Man come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let me share with you just four simple truths from verse 10 that I think will help us to be able to understand grace for the sinner, grace for Zacchaeus here. Number one, Luke tells us that only a Savior can save. Only a Savior can say, look at verse 10, for the Son of Man. One of the favorite terms that Luke has for Jesus is the Son of Man. And we know that Jesus was the only 200% person who ever lived. He was 100% God, and he was 100% human. And it's interesting in the book of Matthew, Matthew focuses more upon the royalty and the deity John focuses upon the deity of Jesus. Luke focuses upon the humanity of Jesus. That he's a human. That he gets tired. That he weeps. That he sheds blood. But Luke, Luke is the only one who tells us in all the gospel of accounts that tells us about Bethlehem and being born and the night that he was born. Luke tells us Jesus is a man, but he is not any man. He is the Son of God which means he is God himself. As the Son of Man, Jesus came to do some things. For Jesus, for the Son of Man came. What? Jesus is my sacrifice. Jesus, as the Son of Man, came and he died for my sins. When Jesus Christ goes to the cross within a week of this passage here, he's going to go to the cross and he'll die, die for sin. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. When we sin against the holy God, the punishment for that is to have death upon us physically as well as eternally to be separated from God forever. Jesus is going to go to the cross. Now remember, when Jesus goes to the cross, he's never sinned. He's the perfect son of God. He's never done anything wrong. There is no judgment come against him. In fact, you know, Pilate washes his hands and said, this man is innocent. Even, though, even the authorities recognize the purity of Jesus. And yet, he died. Why? Did he die for his own sins? No. He died for yours and he died for me. 
Jesus died and paid the penalty on the cross. There on the cross of Calvary, Jesus took and died and paid my physical, but also Jesus when he was on the cross. You remember how the gospel writers tell us that there was darkness upon the face of the earth. And for three hours, from 12 to 3 o'clock, when Jesus took his last breath, there was nothing but darkness. And Jesus cried out from the cross and he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Lama, lama, sabachthani. Where God the Father, you realize of God the Father, who had forever throughout eternity been in perfect relationship with his son, turned his back on Jesus because Jesus became sin for you and me. All that I had ever done, all that I will ever do, every sin that I had committed was at that moment placed upon Jesus and Jesus became sin for me. My dying on the cross because He is the eternal Son of God, He could pay even my eternal debt of hell that I would have to pay. Jesus bore that upon. Do you realize that Jesus on the cross took the penalty of your eternal hell upon himself? That's why he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? To be in hell is to be separated from God the Father forever. Forget about the fire. There's fire there. I, I understand that. The Bible talks about the fires of hell. The greatest torment of hell is to be separated from the loving, gracious hand of the God who made you and to never, ever to be able to see his face again. Jesus took that upon the cross. He died for my sins. He died as my substitute. He took my place. Jesus died for us. He was a sacrifice. He died for my sins. He was my substitute. He died in my place. In other words, do you remember when the man Barabbas was let go? Barabbas was the one who was supposed to, to be crucified. And they said, no, we're going to release someone. So they let the, the murderer, Barabbas was a terrorist. And they let the terrorist go, and they let Jesus die in Barabbas' place. What a picture. We are all Barabbas. We're all sinners. If we want to put ourselves in the Easter story, the best place to put ourselves is a Barabbas. We're the sinner. We deserve to die. And he died for us as a substitute. And then Jesus died on the cross as the sinless one. Never sinned, never did anything that deserved death. For the Son of Man... Here's truth number two. Only a search will find the lost. That's what Luke says. For the Son of Man has come. Why did he come? To seek. He's come to seek. He's looking. Why is Jesus in Jericho? He, he's not there for the Levites. He's not there for the religious crowd. He's not for the church going crowd. You see, there. there the Levites, the religious crowd, are going to be the ones who are going to be crying out within a week, crucified, and put them on the cross. Why is Jesus in Jericho? Because there's a man there who's a sinner who needs to get saved. And God has already been working in the heart of Zacchaeus. How do we know this? Because when Zacchaeus gets news that Jesus is coming to Jericho, a crowd starts forming, Zacchaeus is in the crowd. He wants to see what's going on. And so Zacchaeus climbs up in a tree because he's a short dude and he can't see over the crowd, but he wants to get a vantage seat to see Jesus, which tells me that Zacchaeus is searching for Jesus, but what Zacchaeus doesn't know is that Jesus has come to Jericho for him. He didn't come for the church crowd. He came for the sinner. In fact, Jesus came for the biggest sinner in town. And that was Zacchaeus. I want you to notice what uh, it says only a search will find the lost. Number one, Jesus is searching for, and I've, and I've written here in my notes, Jesus is searching for sinners, but really it should be this. Jesus is searching for you. You. When I was six years old, I got saved in a little Baptist church in eastern North Carolina. My parents were, my dad was a deacon in the church. Mom served in the church as well. And church not unlike about like here. 
And I had grown up and been in Sunday school and had been hearing the gospel story and heard about Jesus and all those kind of things. But it was in a revival service toward the end of the week, sitting right in that area right there. There's where mom and dad always sat in the front, and I had to sit with them. I'm sitting there with them in a revival service on a Friday night. Evangelist preached and he's given the gospel invitation. I'd grown up in church. I'd heard many gospel invitations. My mom and dad had given to me. I heard them in Sunday school. I heard them in vacation Bible school. I heard them in revivals. But in that particular night, God spoke to me because God was searching for me. The invitation was given and I was squirming. And, and, and really, when they said go forward, I, I, I just didn't. I just, I just didn't. Remember, just embarrassed or just, I, I just didn't. And I remember my mother must have said something because she put her arm around me and she began to pray for me. The service ended. The evangelist walked out the, the, walked down the middle aisle, walked to the back door. And mom and dad, because we sat in the front, we were the last to go out. As we came to the evangelist, I remember he's standing there, he's drenched with sweat. I mean, he had preached up a storm that night. And I took him by the hand and and I just did a little boy, six-year-old boy, said to him, he gave the invitation tonight. I didn't go forward. I wanted to. Would you pray with me right now? He said, absolutely. And there were folks gathered around him at the door. And he took my hand, and we walked down the aisle, and right there. I knew the gospel story. I knew John 3, 16, but he went through the simple plan of salvation again with me and said, do you want to trust Christ as your Savior? And I said, yes, I do. And I prayed, trusted Christ as my Savior. <laughs> 58 years ago. Why did I go from there to there to there to trust in Christ? Because on that service on that night, there was a loving God in heaven. And Jesus Christ, God's son, said, Tonight, I've come to seek Jeffrey Lynn Gaskins. And I'm calling him to salvation, to repentance of his sin, and for him to trust Jesus Christ as the personal Savior. If you get saved, it's because there's a loving Father who's already seeking you. Why do you think you're in church today? Why do you think you come to church and things? Why? Because God's seeking you. He's giving you the gospel message through your pastor, through vacation Bible school, through the youth ministry, through your Sunday school teacher, through your mom and dad. There's a God who loves you and who cares about you and who is saying to you, come to me, repent of your sin, trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. There's a God who's seeking you. But now don't you also notice that there is a sinner who's seeking for Jesus. Do you see how this works? I absolutely believe in the, in the sovereignty of God when it comes to salvation. I cannot get saved. No one can get saved unless there is a God who is seeking me. A God who is sending His convicting Holy Spirit. A God who has given me the word where I'm hearing the gospel message preached. Where I'm hearing the Sunday school lesson. Where I'm hearing that. And God is seeking and drawing me and convicting me. But at the very same time, there is the responsibility of, that we have to respond to that and to come seeking Him. God's sovereignty. You never get saved unless God calls you. But you never get saved as well until you respond to that call of God that comes to your life. Zacchaeus was seeking Jesus. Why? Well, there could be a lot of reasons. Curiosity. You know, there's a lot of reasons why people come to church or they seek out religion or they're interested in who Jesus is. Curiosity. There's going to be a show. There's, you know, not much, you know, people are coming, people are lining the streets. Let's see this miracle worker. Maybe there's some connections. Do you remember that one of the disciples was named Matthew? Wrote the Gospel of Matthew. Guess what the occupation of Matthew was before he got saved? He was a tax collector. Do you think Zacchaeus heard about it? Do you think all these tax collectors knew one another? Absolutely. 
He probably knows Matthew. Matthew has now been following Jesus for three years. He's given up all of that money, all of that prestige, all of that power. He's given it away, and now he is following Jesus and has become a full-fledged disciple of Jesus. Zacchaeus has probably heard of Matthew. Conscience. You live a greedy, selfish, self-centered lifestyle. You steal from other people. When you would rob your mother in the casket, your conscience is going to bother you. That comes out a lot of ways. It may come out of anger. It may come out of whatever. But you cannot sin and get away with it. You have the image of God stamped upon your heart. And the Holy Spirit of God is going to speak to you and says, you are a sinner. Every time Zacchaeus stole from people, every time he foreclosed on a widow's house, every time he put someone in jail because they could not pay their taxes, Zacchaeus knew it was wrong. And he knew he was stacking up a debt of sin. Compassion. Maybe Zacchaeus was thinking, well, you know, everybody else hates me. <laughs> I've heard that Jesus is a friend of sinners. Maybe he'll like me, you know. I don't know. It was just companionship. Where Zacchaeus is just thinking, you know, I, I want to know, I want to get to know this man. He's different. He forgives sinners. He loves people. Maybe there's maybe there's hope for me yet. You see it? For the Son of Man. Is come to seek. It's truth number three. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save. Truth number three. Only salvation will rescue the lost. And to save. What does it mean to be saved? It does not mean you turn over a new leaf has nothing to do with you becoming a member of Green Sea Baptist Church. It has nothing to do with being baptized. Our small preachers used to say when you have outside baptism, you get baptized in the creek until the frog known by name doesn't make you a Christian. You can sit in church all you want to. Like, you can sit in the garage all you want to, but sitting in the garage won't make you a car. This church does not have as its purpose for you to be a better person. Ultimately, let them hear me out. Can you become a better person in the church house among God's people? Absolutely. But that's not its purpose. Jesus didn't come to give you a purpose for life. I, I need to have a purpose. I need to have some guidance and direction. We seem to live in a directionless life where people don't know where they're going. Well, Jesus can give you purpose. Jesus can make you a better husband or a better wife. And there's a there's a many a man been drugged to church because his wife wanted her husband to be better. If I just get him to church, he'll love me more. If I get him to church, he'll quit beating me or quit drinking or whatever it is that sin is that's bought. If I just get him to church, he'll be a better person. You know, you'll be good in church. Here's what's wrong with that. The temple in Jerusalem is full of good people. What are they going to do? They're going to kill Jesus. Trying to be good, trying to turn over a lead, trying to find your purpose, trying to find your direction and guidance and whatever is not why Jesus came. Jesus came to save you. Easiest illustration of that is that you are drowning. You are going to die. Your lungs are going to fill with water. You're not going to be able to take another breath. And if someone doesn't come along and drag you by the nap of the neck and drag you out of that pond or out of the ocean, you are going to die. That is inevitable. It will happen. You're going to die. Jesus is the lifeguard who saves you from dying. He's going to save you from your sins by forgiving you and releasing you from that debt that you owe to a holy God. He's going to release you from that burden of carrying around that guilt. He's also going to save you from, I still believe that the Bible teaches that there is a place called hell. 
I know people don't like that, but I get it. We live in a society in which culture is kind of put hell to the side. We don't want to talk about that. People like it's offensive. But do you realize that we know more about hell from the lips of Jesus than any other person in the Bible? Jesus talked about hell more than anybody else. Why? That's why he came to die. So that you and I don't have to go there. Remember, Jesus is going to experience hell on the cross. He's going to know what it's like. He says, I don't want you to go there. I'm going to make the way plain. I'm going to make it clear. I'm going to die for your sins. You don't have to. You can be forgiven of the debt of your sin. And I will save you. He's going to save you from yourself. You ever talk much to yourself? I do. Jeffrey. Usually in my conversations go like that. Jeffrey, that was stupid. Why did you do that? Why did you act that way? Why did you say that? I wish I hadn't have done that. Anybody ever have any self-talk like that? Jesus came to save you from that person because when I'm in heaven, I will not be saying, why did you do that? Why do you say that? I will be like, be given the spirit of Christ and to be like him in which I will be able to live and to do what is right and holy from the inside to the outside for all of eternity. There's never going to be any self-talk in heaven about why did I do that? I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have hurt this person or whatever. He came to save me from me. I can't control me. I can't make myself do right. I can't make myself say the right thing or do the right thing. I always do the wrong thing. I need someone to save me from my sins, to save me from myself, and to save me from hell where I deserve to go. That's why Jesus came to Jericho to Zacchaeus. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save Number four, not only will only a Savior can save for the Son of Man, only a search will find the lost, came to seek, only salvation will rescue the lost and to save, but lastly, only sinners can be saved. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Here's what you and I need to understand. Romans 3.10, 3, there's none righteous, no, not one. For all of sin, Romans 3.23, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us are born sinners. Now you and I sin, which is the acts of sin, but the reason we do that is because we are sinners. I'm, I need you to understand, to make no mistake, babies are born sinners. You see, if you don't know that, you've never had a baby. What, what, is, what, is, what is a baby? They are the self-center of their world. They are the definition of sin. Feed me. Take care of me. Do it. I demand that you do this. Take care of me. Meet my needs. Do me. And if you don't, I will cry. I'll bite you. I'll do other things to you if you don't meet my needs. Does that sound like a sinner? Children do not come out of the womb going, thank you, yes ma'am, no sir, you know, picking up their clothes, whatever. They are born selfish little, people like to say well, children are like babies. No, they're more like demons from hell. <laughs> That's who we are. That's how we're born. Why? We inherited that sin nature. When Adam and Eve took that sin and they rebelled against God, it's been flowing through the gene pool all the way down to every single one of us. And then I act on How do I know that I have that sinful nature? Because I act on it. I do things that are sinful. I hurt people. I cheat. I steal. I lie. I have sexual sins. I do things in my life that are, I curse the name of God. That's called the Ten Commandments. We break those. Jesus came to save a sinner. How did we how did we know that Zacchaeus understood that he was a sinner? He said, Lord, 
I give half of my goods to the poor. If I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. I don't think he was saying, well, if maybe I did it. He was saying, I did it. This is what I'm going to do to make restitution. So basically, he was at this point, because of his repentant spirit, was going to give, uh, give away all of his wealth to all the people that he was stolen. That's the reason we know he got saved. And also because Jesus said, verse 9, Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house. This is now the sinner who has salvation. And notice what Jesus said. Now this is, remember I told you where he's at. He's in Jericho. Jericho's full of Levites. It's full of the religious crowd. The Jewish people thought that they were right with God simply because they were descendants of Abraham. I go to the temple, I pay my taxes, I pay my alms, I do good things. I, I'm, I was born a Jew, I was born under the covenant. Therefore, I am right with God simply because of my birthright. I'm a son of Abraham. Do you see this? Today, salvation has come to this house because he also, Zacchaeus, is a son of Abraham. Who's Abraham? Abraham wasn't saved by the law. The law came later on. Abraham wasn't saved by the temple or he wasn't saved by the sacrifices. Abraham was saved because Romans tells us that Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Abraham was right with God because he believed God in faith. And what Jesus is saying is that anyone who comes by faith repents of their sin believe that Jesus died for them, understands that they are sinners who need to be saved, you too can be a son of Abraham. <laughs> you imagine that crap. What do you mean, Jesus? I'm good. You're not a son of Abraham. I'm not so bad. I'm not like this guy. You're not a son of Abraham. I go to church. You're not a son of Abraham. I've been baptized. You're not a son of Abraham. I'm not as bad as other people. You know, a son of Abraham, a child of God, is someone who has repented of their sins, realized that there is a Savior who has died for their sins, and by faith has repented of those sins and trusted Jesus and Jesus alone to save them. What a story. A few days later, Jesus is going to go into the city of Jerusalem. Palm branches are coming down. He's going to go in and cleanse the temple. He's going to meet with his disciples. He's going to wash their feet. He's going to give them the Last Supper. Then he's going to be arrested that night. The next day, drug out, crucified on a cross outside the city of Jerusalem. When Jesus died at 3 o'clock on that Good Friday, it was at the very same time. When Jesus died at 3 o'clock on Friday afternoon, it was the very same time that these Levites were in the temple sacrificing the lambs for the Passover. The bleeding and the blood of the lambs was bleating in the city of Jerusalem. Many of them did not know that the Lamb of God was dying on a cross for the sins of the world. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. If you want to understand and enjoy Easter, you've got to come to this Lamb who died for your sins. For He came to seek and to save you because you and I are lost and need a Savior. Let's pray. His mouth and eyes closed. Father, thank You for this Word. Thank You for Zacchaeus. Lord, I remember singing that song as a kid, Vacation Bible School, Booster Man on Sunday night. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, come down, for I'm going to your house today. Lord Jesus, I'm thankful that you stopped by Vanceboro, North Carolina. 
you saw me up a tree. And you said, today, Jeffrey, I'm going home with you. Today is the day you're going to get saved. God's spoken to your heart today. You've been in church. You've heard your pastor preach. You've been in Sunday school this morning. And yet you have not responded yet and said, Lord Jesus, save me. Not asking you about being a member of the church or being baptized. Those things come after salvation, obviously. But I'm asking you, are you right with God? You have a person, are you right with God? He came to save you. You're lost without Jesus. You've grown up in this church. You're lost without Jesus. God's speaking to you today. God's speaking to us as a church today and say, Church, Easter's coming. And the message is, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Easter means Jesus died for you. He died for everybody. You can be saved. You can enjoy the resurrection life and hope that He has. The victory that you can have over your sin. I pray that will be the celebration in this church in the next few weeks. And that the continuing gospel message from Green Sea Baptist Church, which has been faithfully preached for 200 years, will continue to share the message of Jesus Christ in this community until Jesus comes again and will call you home. Father, I pray for this morning, maybe one who... God is speaking to them today through the Holy Spirit that God is seeking. They are feeling that convicting power of their sin. Father, I pray that you'd help them to understand that coming to Jesus is as simple as saying, I am a sinner. I deserve the punishment of hell for my sin. But Jesus, you died for me. You took my place, my substitute. And Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, the best way that I know how I turn from my sin today. And Jesus, I turn to you. Lord Jesus, save me. Make me your child. I want to be a son or a daughter of Abraham. I want to be a child of faith. Father, I may pray that there's one here today who's prayed that. As we have an invitation, as we come to this time of commitment, that Lord, you'll speak to that heart. And there'll be a time today where they'll say, Lord Jesus, I come. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand if you would, please. We're going to have an invitation again if you've been playing it. God's spoken to your heart.